This $800 GoPro is smoother than your $27,000 rig. And the problem is, it might just always be. In this episode of Film Science, we deep dive into every type of stabilization and why it's almost impossible to get perfect. Shaky footage is something we've all had to deal with, and the temptation is just to chuck it in Premiere, throw on some warp stabilizer, and call it a day. Which works, most of the time. But sometimes you end up with a jelly blurry mess. How do you get smooth cinematic footage every single time? To understand that, we need to understand how stabilization actually works. When we look at all types of stabilizers, we're dealing with two factors, the method of motion detection and the method of motion compensation. How each stabilization method performs these two functions results in some pretty big differences in how your footage ends up looking. So we're putting all the different kinds of stabilization to the test in the studio and out in the field. We attached an iPhone, GoPro Max, A7S III with IBIS, EUSR with warp stabilizer, and a C200 on a pro-level gimbal. Each uses a different method of stabilization to compensate for camera shake, so we're going to see which circumstances each perform better in. It was pretty clear that the GoPro was the smoothest across all situations, with the iPhone and the Pro gimbal trailing a little bit behind. The IBIS on the Sony freaked out for any large movements, and seemed to stabilize for a second, shake, and then stabilize again. And warp stabilizer at 50%? Well, uh, it warped alright. But the most interesting thing was that each method of stabilization resulted in its own quirks. So what causes these differences? It's all in how they detect and counter the movement. Chapter 1. Detection for motion detection, stabilizers either use a motion sensing chip called an IMU, or they calculate the motion of the camera using feature recognition within the final image. This IMU is a collection of sensors with an accelerometer and a gyroscope, allowing the device to know how it's moving, rotating, and how fast. They're tiny, relatively cheap, and in so many devices these days. Most importantly, they offer a real-time readout, which can be used to reduce or remove movement. If you don't have this data in something like Warp Stabilizer, you'll be detecting the motion from the footage itself using something called feature recognition, tracking objects in the frame to then interpolate where the camera moved. When it comes to detecting motion, a gyro is so much better, but you need to have it built into your camera or stabilizer. The main problem with feature recognition is that sometimes it just gets it wrong. An object moving through the foreground can often throw off the track, where the software can't tell the difference between object movement and camera movement, resulting in a very jello -y shot. While feature tracking is certainly more limited, it's only getting better as the machine learning and algorithms improve. Warp Stabilizer today is leagues ahead of where it was when it first launched. But none of that is useful without Chapter 2, Countering the Movement. Once we know our movement, we can counter it in a couple of ways. Option 1 is a gimbal. From the affordable to the professional, all gimbals work in pretty much the same way. Motors across three axes rotate to counter pan, tilt, and roll movements, leaving us with a camera that is rotationally constant. And they're great! Gimbals have become a near-essential piece of kit for most filmmakers, and are useful in situations where a dolly or slider wouldn't be possible. The thing is, they have inherent physical limitations. As they counter the movement of the camera, they need to provide an equal and opposite force, which becomes harder and more expensive the bigger your camera gets. Balancing a gimbal properly certainly helps this, but in the end they're large, heavy, and take some skill to operate, and sometimes you just don't want to carry one around. Which brings us to option two, in camera with a floating element or sensor. We say floating, but technically it's not. The camera senses movement and counters it using a bunch of tiny electromagnets, shifting the image to close to where it was in the previous frame. This can happen in the lens, in the sensor, or a combination of both, and I think it's been built into every camera I've owned so far but it is limited, predominantly in how much it can counter the movement. Because it's built into the body, there's limited space, and as a result, it doesn't deal well with really large shakes. It's perfect for countering the shake of your hands in the pursuit of getting a more crisp image, but it's not gonna help much if you're mountain biking down a hill. We saw this limitation clearly in our tests. It deals okay with push shots and translation movement, but rotating the camera past about six degrees in each direction caused it to hit its limit. For those movements, we need something stronger. And that brings us to option three digital stabilization. This can be done purely after shooting with scene analysis, like with warp stabilizer, or it can be done with the gyro in the case of the GoPro, the iPhone, or Blackmagic's new gyro-assisted stabilization for the Pocket Cine. By moving and warping the image, we can create footage that is terrifyingly smooth, but it requires a few tricks that also lead to a few limitations. Most digital stabilization relies on taking an image that is larger than you'll use in your final. In the case of the iPhone, you can see it crop by about 30% when you go into video 
mode. And for something like the GoPro Max, it can take spherical images, allowing for complete rotation. The thing is, when we counter that motion, there are often artifacts left behind. Things like motion blur, which look great in normal video, but once it's warped, it kind of feels weird. It makes the viewer feel like there's something wrong with the footage. Action cameras often get around this by having a short shutter speed, effectively eliminating all motion blur because you can always add it in afterwards. And it looks eh, almost correct. This doesn't work that well in dark or low light environments though, because there's only so fast that shutter speed can be. Digital stabilization can answer a lot of shake problems, but the trade-off is usually your footage looking cinematic. So why can't we just put digital stabilization in a better camera? It would be ideal, and to a certain extent, it already exists in mirrorless bodies. It's just not quite as impressive as the GoPro because it exists on a different end of the spectrum. You are unlikely to strap one of these on your head and jump off a cliff. It's also inherently limited by the camera itself. The motion blur and frame size tricks used by GoPro won't work on a mirrorless camera. Combine this with issues of rolling shutter on a larger sensor size and a lens distortion profile that can change from focal length to focal length, and you're left with the fact that a purpose-built action cam might just always be smoother. So what's the answer? Use the right stabilization for the right job. If you shoot action sports, buy a GoPro instead of strapping a cinecam to your head. And if a cinematic masterpiece is your goal, use a gimbal. If it was easy, everyone would do it. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think or leave a question in the comments down below. We try to respond to everyone. See ya.